Hey everyone. Uh, can, first of all, can you hear me clearly? Am I coming across clearly? Cool. Um, right. So I'm, I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to jump straight in. Um, Maisha, uh, Maisha and Johanna before me, they gave brilliant, you know, lectures and raised a lot of brilliant points. Um, mine is not going to be as well structured as that, unfortunately, because there's just so much to say and such little time to say it. So please, please, please bear with me. Um, so I'm going to start off by introducing myself. My name is Dapo Adiola. I am Nigerian, British born to two Nigerian parents, uh, fluent in my language. And I also speak English, as you can hear. Um, I am a self-taught illustrator, and I am now two years into a career in children's book illustration. Okay, so when I say I'm self-taught, I learned um, art and design up until I'd say about about college over here, which is the age of 18, I believe. And um, I failed miserably at art and graphic design in school. And then I went on to fail at a graphic design and advertising degree. So um, education was not really for me. Um, I was the child that had the talent, but didn't have the focus or the drive. Okay. So, and, and not, not, not the focus or the drive, the direction. That's what I meant. I didn't have the direction. And that's because I didn't know. I knew I wanted to draw for a living, but I wasn't aware of the things, you know, I, I didn't see reflections of myself in these careers. So there was no way of me knowing where I belonged basically so uh we're going to go into the work now i'm going to pull up the screen and show you some of my work as i talk okay right there we go right so these are some examples of pdf i put together for this particular uh webinar that we're doing today so these are some examples of my work um these are some characters that i designed for books and various other projects um so as you can see i like to have quite a diverse range of you know different types of people that I might come across in the characters. The purpose of each character design is to tell a story so that you can just look at the picture and you can instantly attach things based on what you know of people in your own life and people that you've come across to the characters to tell different stories. And I'm always amazed by the different things that people come up with when they look at each character that sometimes even stray outside of the realm of what it is that I had envisioned when I was designing the characters. Um, Maisha mentioned earlier, the importance of normalizing children and this was something i was doing instinctively without knowing i was doing it because again two years in the game and i'm only just now learning so much of the language around um what's going on regarding diversity i didn't have the language before i just knew things instinctively i knew that it was important for example for black children to be depicted having as much fun as their white counterparts are allowed to have. So that's what fueled the drawings that I was doing. Um, this is one of my favorite illustrations and one of the most popular ones. And I don't really need to explain this for anyone who knows the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, this was another one that I did that was pretty fun. And it was based on Beyonce's single ladies videos and it's, it's, it's a music video and it's really quite popular as well. Um, these are two characters from a book that I, my first actual book, which is a, um, an early reader's chapter book that was published in America and written by an African-American author, Lamar Giles, and it's called The Last Last Days of Summer. And um, this was, I, I was approached to design the characters for this book and instantly these boys jumped into my head based on the text. Uh, this is a character that I designed for a friend of mine, sci-fi pitch for a book that hasn't come out yet. Don't really know what's going on with that, but um, it was a lot of fun designing her as well. Um, and this is the cat from my, uh, uh, my, my picture book, my current picture book, Look Up. Um, right, so that brings me to my career in publishing. So this is Look Up. This is my love child with my friend, Nathan Brian. Um, it is an amazing, amazing book. I can't, I, it, I get weird when I talk about this because um, it, it's obviously my first picture book. Prior to this book, I'd never drawn a book in my life. I was a character designer. I had no knowledge of it. I'm going to give you a short story about the background of this book. I had no intention of getting into children's publishing at the time that I ended up in this world that I'm in now. My goal was always to draw things that I enjoy drawing. And then eventually, at some point, I'd make a book if I wanted to. And then maybe I'd put it out and someone might buy it. Who knows? Um, Nathan, on the other hand, 
is a accomplished screenwriter and an actor and he's very professional about his creativity whereas I, I wasn't up until now and um, he came to me with this idea he was like that so I've got this idea I want to write a picture book about a little girl who's obsessed with space has big hair and glasses and I was like okay cool I went away designed the character based a lot of her mannerisms on my my I can't say this but I'm going to say it I based it on my favorite niece and um Rocket was born as a result. And again, one of the crazy things about this was we were having fun. We were just having fun. We, we didn't have any messages that we were trying to, you know, wrap into this story. It, was, it wasn't that. We were determined it wasn't going to be that. And then what ended up happening is um, we, especially myself regarding design choices, I made a lot of design choices that reflected um, a character that didn't appeal to any particular gender. And I didn't even, I wasn't aware I was doing this. Simple things like putting her in a, in a, in a um, gender neutral color in form of the orange jumpsuit, for example. You know, we were in publishing meetings and they were like, oh, we like this character, but why don't you have her have a, a blue jumpsuit? And I was like, no, I like the orange one. Thank you very much. So these were all decisions that were made just because I liked how it looked, you know. Um, and when the book came out, we found that those decisions that we made instinctively in storytelling and even in uh, visual presentation, it allowed a lot of children from various backgrounds to bond with this character because it wasn't about her being a girl. It wasn't about any of those things. You know, it was just about a child that loves space. And that was it. So any children that had that in common with her, bam, they were in there, you know? Um, I forgot to include the pictures that we had I'll, do you know what? I'll pull it up online. I'll pull it up online. I forgot to include the pictures that we had from uh, World Book Day. So I'm skipping through. This was the early designs of Rocket um, before she became this. This was her first initial design. And this was me just having a play around. And again, one of the things that has baffled me since coming into this industry is the misrepresent misrepresentation visually that happens when non-Black people draw Black characters. It's really not that hard to get it right it really isn't that hard to get it right and maybe I'm taking for granted the fact that I am black but I also know that in order for me to get it right I had to do my research and there are loads and loads and loads and loads of examples out there of black characters drawn well that do not racialize the design so it's not uh, you know, I'm going to come to this later on in this little uh, seminar, this little uh, presentation that I'm giving, and I'm going to show you some bad examples, right, that, that, um, that have historical connotations attached to them with colonialism, slavery, all sorts of stuff, just really, really terrible representation of Black people that, for some reason, still show up today in publications like Charlie Hebdo and other you know, cartoonists around Europe and um, Australia, for example, we had this Serena Williams debacle in 2017, where she was depicted in a horrible fashion by an Australian cartoonist. And he came on TV and claimed that he didn't know what he was doing. It, it was just all right. It really wasn't. We're taught in, in art class. I mean, even though I didn't, you know, succeed, I failed at school. But I do remember that we were taught about those images. We were taught about those images and the historical connotations attached to them. That's the first time I encountered it. So anyway, moving on. Rocket then became this lovely little girl that you're seeing in front of you. Um, this was the first sort of design that I pitched of her um, in this style and it just, it just worked, right? Um, and then this is an image from the book. So another thing about children's book illustration that I think is very important. If we're talking about looking, you know, wanting diversity, I think it's massively important that we, um, it, it, it's massively important that we also make sure that the diversity is accurate, right? So Nathan didn't put this in the text. I put this in the illustrations. It's nowhere to be found in the text. And it's just the moment that's occurring between Rocket and her mum. And it's not mentioned in the text at all, but it's a moment that many people have messaged me and been like, oh my God, this is me. Oh my God, this is my child. And it was just because I wanted to do this drawing. It, it has no context in the story whatsoever, but it's actually the most popular image in the whole book, right? In terms of the image that everybody talks to me about. And I've seen books that have been lauded in the UK publishing industry, children's books, right? 
for um, being great stories and being diverse. And it really just looks like, from my perspective anyway, that somebody has drawn a character and essentially just colored the character in black. Why do I say that? Because there is nothing else in the visuals that even speaks about the heritage or the culture of the character. And that's something that you can do without smacking people over the head with it. You can put little things here and there, just drawing scenes that explain why you've had, you, you have a diverse character in this book. Scenes that make it feel more uh, organic, more, more believable, if you will, you know, that inform the character and the story just a little bit more. That's really not that hard to do. However, a lot of books that come out that have diverse characters that come out as a response to the critique of the children's book industry lacking diverse characters. A lot of those books that have come out since, they, can't, they don't do the representation accurately. They do it just for the sake of it. And then we have diversity for diversity's sake, which is almost setting us back again. Right, so this is just a scene from the book as well. Um, just a little scene from her household. Again, I suck at drawing backgrounds, I'll be really honest with you. So, you know, yellow walls, white floor, boom, background, done. Um, this is one of my favorite scenes from the book. Um, I really enjoy, I'm a character designer by nature, so I'm only just now, if I'll be really honest with you, learning how to be a fully fledged illustrator in terms of drawing environments, but give me a character to draw against the white background, that's where I shine. So I really loved drawing her, drawing her having fun, just being creative and being imaginative. This is, yeah, love this. Right, jumping on. Right, now we get to the meat and bones of what I want to talk about today. So um, if we're talking about influences, my influences were Tintin, Asterix, um, those, those comics that I was given at a very young age. And um, Maisha talked about being given Pippi Longstocking at a young age, right? We learn from what we're given and it's not until we're adults that we tend to start questioning what we were given as children because we're not seeing accurate reflections in the world, right? So Asterix I grew up on, I loved Asterix, I loved Tintin, and it wasn't until I was, I, this always niggled me as a child, mind you, looking at these representations of black people that were popular. It wasn't until I was an adult and I was able to sort of broaden my horizons and see other representations that were more accurate and joyous to look at that I was able to look back at these and really call them out for the crap that they are. Like, this is awful. And it brings me to one thing that I want to talk about here today in, in the short time that I have. And that's, we can't talk about fixing diversity in children's books if we're not going to talk about the lack of diversity off the page in the countries and, and how diversity is represented in general in those societies. And, you know, black people, you know, I'm not here to play a little violin at all, but I am going to tell you that it's amazing that amongst the ethnic diversities, black people almost have a monopoly on bias and hatred globally. Like it's wild. In England, we refer to our ethnic groups as BAME, right? And that's black and minority ethnic. That's what that means, right? And in essence, what we're doing by doing that is we're lumping everybody together to make it easier for white people to just be like, we're gonna fix the problem. And the issue is all these groups that you've lumped into BAME all have their own individual struggles. Some of these groups don't even get along, right? And we've just lumped them together. And the issue is black people trying to thrive within BAME, we're a minority within a minority in a lot of cases. And that's, it, it's wild to me, like it's, it's suffocating. We're all, I mean, no one's talked about it, but we're all aware of what's happening in the world right now, literally right now, right? And there's a massive outcry where a lot of black people have had enough of being misrepresented, of being harassed, treated badly. And it's such, it's such a it's, it's a sad thing because it's a wonderful thing to see that finally people are being very vocal about this thing and they're talking to their peers their non-black peers from all different backgrounds and asking why is it that you remain silent on this issue when you're all seeing it so i'm not going to get into that but that is something that is related to what we're seeing on page if that makes any sense it's related it's all linked um this is something that was very interesting to me today. Um, so this is Dutch festival, is it Black Pete, I believe? Yeah, I'm seeing you nodding in the video, so I'm assuming I'm correct. So this is something that, if I'm correct, it's, it's problematic in, in, in um, the Dutch community and it's still going on. 
And we've got black people who are also of Dutch descent protesting it in the bottom image, but it's still going on. And this is, this is the wild thing. This is where it gets tiring. We're very vocal about representation, both on and off the page, how we like to be represented, how we don't like to be represented. We're very vocal about it, but then there's this whole kind of, I don't know, this, this almost gaslighting that happens where we're being told that there's not a problem when there clearly is one, you know? So I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here because I, I promised myself I wouldn't ramble. But yeah, this, this is the thing, we can't fix representation on the page if we don't acknowledge how black people and people of color from various backgrounds are being represented in the societies that we live in. A lot of people tuned in to this webinar today, for example, I'm, I'm imagining, I don't know, I can't see you all, but I am imagining that you are a predominantly Caucasian audience that I'm talking to today, okay? So the thing for me is, are you, how educated are you? And I'm, I'm, this is a presumption on my part, completely an assumption on my part. How educated are you on these matters? How educated are you on what the problems are off the page? You know, it's all well and good when we're talking about wanting to have accurate and positive representations of black children on the page. But unfortunately, what that ends up doing is it ends up dangling a carrot of hope in front of these children in, in the form of these representations on the page, if the reality of the world is completely different, right? And this is a, this is a conversation that I'm having with my publishers at the moment, off of what I feel about what's going on. All the stories that I'm involved in, there's this sort of, because it's white publishers. I am, I forgot to give you this statistic. I am one of two black British illustrators in the children's book industry in the UK, one of two. Please let that sink in because there are thousands of illustrators working in the children's book industry in the UK. I am one of two. And also, just to give you some perspective on that statistic, the first person is a gentleman by the name of Ken Wilson Max. Ken has been working for 34 years. I am 37 years old. So Ken has been working since, he was, since I was three years old, right? And between Ken and me, there was no one. So that's just to give you some perspective on what I'm talking about. So again, the stories that I'm working on at the moment, there's this sort of, and you know, they don't mean to do this, but it's, 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 it's part of what publishing does and how the publishing machine works. To an extent, it is quite lazy. What I'm being told to do is to draw stories that show black children having joy and fun and being normal. And that's great, that's fantastic. And I do want to do that. But I also think that the publishing industry is missing a beat because there aren't picture books or children's literature beyond um, younger than YA that deal with racism, like really deal with it, really tackle the subject. There's a fear to really get stuck into the subject. And I'm not saying to you that we should scare children, not at all, because it is a scary topic, but don't underestimate a child's ability to understand this, because if you don't do it in this safe environment where, where it can be explored safely, the world is going to remind these children that they're black. And it's often not gonna be done in a safe, and friendly manner, you know? And also, it's enabling us, because these are conversations that we as black people have to have with our children now. We have to talk to them about racism. We have to talk to them about the fact that their skin color is going to make, and it's going to almost guarantee that wherever they go in the world, they're treated differently, right? These are conversations that we have to have, but our white counterparts have the luxury of not having to have that conversation, right? And the thing is, the children's industry for me is missing a beat because that conversation is a conversation that can benefit both. It can benefit everybody, basically. It's about the windows. I think um, Marisha mentioned this in hers as well. It's the windows. It's, it, you know, it, it's allowing white children to see that this is a problem, this is wrong. And it's allowing black children to be prepared for it as well. You know, when I'm, I'm not advocating in any way to make children paranoid, but I do think that we are missing a beat in the children's publishing especially picture books where we're not discussing this thing so anyway i'm not here to preach to anybody what i will do though is i will offer you these reading recommendations right these are books that i would recommend that you read they're not focused on children's publishing i know we're here today to discuss children's publishing but i do really believe that without an understanding of the world these children inhabit you can't really have an opinion on it that will that will benefit them properly if you don't understand it 
some of this reading is going to make you very uncomfortable, right? But we're not here for anyone's comfort. That's not what we're here for. We're not here to have a nice, pleasant chat. We're here to get into the integrity of it. So these are some of the reading recommendations. I recommend to start with um, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. And then make your way through the rest of them. And also, I'm going to end now. I think I don't know how much time I have. Have I, have I like gone over or do I have more time? Um, it's kind of 15 minutes half past. So. <laughs> All right. So I'm going like to end by saying minutes. this. Hey, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> have a good one, people. I'm going to come off now. <laughs>